Well, good evening to everybody. Certainly good to see you tonight. As we have been stating the last couple nights, we have decided that we are going to do one of our tandem lessons for you <clears throat> this evening, and uh, it's something that we've been enjoying doing back home for the last couple years, and um, hopefully you will enjoy it also as we're going to have the topic of simply baptize. We're going to talk about seven different questions tonight relating to baptism. <clears throat> but first we want to tell you that we're so thankful that you're here tonight. We're thankful for the church here, thankful for the work you've been doing ahead of us coming and during the time of us being here. And it's certainly been a profitable week. We would be uh, you know, remiss if we didn't just mention a few things. We are so thankful for your hospitality, for the dinners that you have uh, had us for and for putting up with us being a little late when we had a study running late. Uh, we're just uh, very thankful for you welcoming us and taking care of us while we're here. And certainly <clears throat> my family needs to thank Brother Billy over there because he put us up for the week in his home. And so uh, it's a special man that will let a wife and husband and two little kids overrun their house with a lot of pretty glass things. So uh, hopefully we did well in his home and we certainly appreciate him having us. All right, and I want to certainly thank Keith and his family for putting us up and taking such good care of us as well. And I want to again echo those sentiments for all the meals and the hospitality that's been shown to us. It's been very encouraging. I also want to give a special thanks to Shane and Keith for all the work that they did before we came. You know, when you think about why a work like this is able to be successful, it really rests largely on the back of the individuals that are here already, the evangelists particularly, that are uh, making sure they have all of the things in place so that when we come, we can walk right in and get to work. It takes a lot to make that happen. And so make sure you give these guys a pat on the back and a thank them for what they've done because I tell you, we've been collaborating on this for months now, getting ready for this effort. And I just I hope you guys are thankful for it. I know that Chris and I both are. Absolutely. So we'll go on now to the subject at hand. Seven questions about baptism. Simply baptized. And so our first question this evening, I think you'll have to give it one more click, Justin. There we go. The simple question of what is baptism? And so that's a question that we may think is rather simplistic, but it is definitely a question that needs to be answered in light of confusion on the topic uh, as we see in the religious world today. And uh, I guess the short answer to this question is probably immersion in water. Uh, what it comes down to. So what do you have to say about it, Justin? You yeah, know, that's right. Just if you were to just look up a definition in a Greek dictionary, for instance, Strong's Greek is a popular one. You find this for the word baptizo, which of course the word baptism is not a translation. It's a transliteration. And that's important to note because if the word were to be translated, then it would be written immersion in your Bibles. But instead it's transliterated. And the reason they do that is because different religious groups have different mindsets on what baptism is. And so they don't want to offend anybody. And so they leave it transliterated in your text so that you as a reader can decide what you want it to mean. However, what we're going to see is that it really isn't up to us to decide what we want it to mean at all. Strong's Greek says the word simply means to dip sink, to be immersed. The idea is a very simple one. In fact, the word isn't just applied when it comes to a religious ceremony. It's used in a general way as well. For instance, if you were to take a piece of clothing and you were to take it outside into your wash bucket and you were to put it underneath the water, what you would describe that action with is the same Greek word, baptizo. You are immersing that garment. You are cleansing the garment in all of those ways. You're making it completely soaked. And so the word was pretty specific in its meaning at the time, but it's given a special religious connotation in our scripture. Chris? Well, Mark 7 and 4, for that matter, uses it in its generic way. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark chapter 7 and verse 4, he says, And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. And that word washing there is baptize, baptizo, but it's translated as washing here in this instance. So ladies, when you do dishes at home, and men, if you're helping your wives at home, uh, <laughs> then you are baptizing dishes when you do that in the general Greek sense of the word. And So we want to make a bit of a distinction here. We want to understand that our Bible <clears throat> is not made up of special religious words. The way the Bible was written is it was just common, generic Greek words that were used, but they were sometimes, of course, given a specialized meaning. And so when he uses baptizo, which meant just to immerse, but he's talking about being immersed in water, say, for the forgiveness of sins, then it takes on a special meaning in that connotation. Whereas today, when we use the word baptize, I have yet to hear a lady say that she baptized her dishes in the sink. Uh, the first work I was at, there was a little boy, he was kind of a smart aleck, and he'd go up to the 
blackboard up there and the baptistry was behind it and he'd throw chalk and erasers down and then he'd come back and say, hey preacher, I just baptismatized that eraser back there, you know. And so he would use it in a generic way, I guess, but um, uh, we generally don't do that. We just use the word immerse and we use baptize for religious significance. But, um, you know, we don't want to think that Jesus was speaking some special language or something. He was just speaking the common Greek and he used that word to talk about being immersed so that we could be cleansed. So we always want to keep that in mind. And, um, you know, Mark chapter 110 tells us something important also, Justin. The passage says, Immediately coming out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. So this is after Jesus' baptism. And so what's significant about Jesus coming up out of the water? Well, certainly the implication is that he had to be in the water, right, in order to be coming up out of the water. Otherwise the statement wouldn't make any sense at all. In fact, you see that same idea in Acts chapter 8. If you were to read verses 36 through 38, you have the teaching of the eunuch. You recall, and uh, he was an Ethiopian, and Philip was called to go to the chariot, and he listened to him heard him reading the scripture, went up and started explaining the scripture to him. And as they went along the road, it says in verse 36, the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? There's some more conversation there we're going to actually get to talk about later in a different study uh, section of this. But he goes on in that to speak about stopping the chariot. And they get out and it says, and they both went down into the water. See, the idea there is pretty clear that when they were baptizing, they were going into the water just as Jesus was there in uh, Matthew chapter 3 and Mark chapter 1. Absolutely. So what is baptism? Baptism is to be immersed in water. And so the second question we have this evening is this. What is Holy Spirit baptism? Because we realize in our New Testament that we read about uh, at least these two types of baptism, but we may read about a little bit more. What do you say, Justin? That's right. Actually, in our New Testaments, there are about seven baptisms that are mentioned. And if you were to think about what those are, we're not going to go and read about them all. But, for instance, you have the baptism of John, and that's referenced in Acts 19, as well as there in Matthew chapter 3 and other places. You have the baptism into Moses in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which is an allusion, really, kind of making a type-antitype relationship out of what we also do. You have the baptism for the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, which I think is, uh, it's more of a play on words that didn't actually happen. What it was, it's saying if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then you're not being baptized for the living, you're being baptized for the dead. And so what are those people that are baptized for the dead going to do? If you don't believe in a resurrection, in other words, baptism doesn't make any sense. And then when you are in uh, Mark chapter 10 and verse 38, you have Jesus referencing the baptism of suffering where he says, can you be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And he's alluding there to the suffering he's going to experience on the cross. And then you have the baptism of fire in well, we Matthew chapter that, 3. No, 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 we don't want the baptism of fire. of fire. That's one of those things that's really kind of interesting because you have a lot of times people referencing this baptism of fire thinking that it's a good thing. But it was not a good thing in the context of what was being said. John was threatening the people that if they continued in sin, they would be baptized in fire. And it's a threat of hell is what it is if you continue to walk in that path. I don't want the baptism of fire. And if you go read that text, I'm sure you'll come to the same conclusion. We don't want that. And then also you have baptism in water that we're talking about. Uh, we'll explain more later on. And then baptism of the Holy Spirit is separate from all of those. It's something different. So Chris, what do you say about that? Well, baptism of the Holy Spirit is an interesting thing because there's so many individuals today that talk about the need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But as we always want to point out, in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul makes clear there's one Lord, one faith, one hope, and he says there's one baptism. So there's just one baptism for the sinner to become a Christian, one baptism that we can undergo and are commanded to undergo that we, that we can do. And so we see it throughout the book of Acts repeatedly, people being immersed in water. So the Holy Spirit baptism, uh, you say, well, then what's it all about? Well, the Holy Spirit baptism was always there to demonstrate a specific uh, point that God needed to make with his people or to accomplish a specific purpose. Now, there's two places in our New Testament where we can clearly say that there was baptism in the Holy Spirit. One for certain, the other one is likely. The first of which is, of course, in Acts chapter 1 and 2. At the beginning of this chapter in Acts chapter 2, reading here at verses 3 and 4, the scripture says, And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested <clears throat> on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. 
And this is the fulfillment of the Lord's prophecy back in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. He says, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Of course, there he's speaking to the apostles. So it was the apostles who were baptized in the Holy Spirit here in Acts chapter 2. And so what was the purpose? The purpose is what we just read. So they would be empowered with the Holy Spirit and they were able to do things like they did that day, speaking in tongues that were foreign to them. Acts chapter 2 and verse 14 explains that it was the twelve who were empowered. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. So it was those twelve men who were baptized in the Holy Spirit on that day. And then when we turn over to Acts chapter 10, I believe we find another occurrence of Holy Spirit likely taking place. Can I cut in for a minute before we get to that account? I think that it's good to consider again the meaning of the word baptizo in that account. You know, when Paul speaks of the spiritual gifts that were handed out to all of the Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that were there in Corinth, he names off nine different spiritual (laughs) gifts that were present in the church. But the interesting thing is, is that when he gets to the end of chapter 12, he speaks of how none of them had all of those gifts, or really even more than one of those gifts. He mentions how each one was given something in part. Some speak in tongues, some prophesy, some have gifts of healing, and so forth. The interesting thing about the word baptizo is it's, again, fully a It's fully covered. The only individuals that we can definitely say were fully given all of those gifts were the holy apostles. And so if you think about that, why is it that the apostles were able to work all of these different spiritual gifts, but everybody else that we see in the scripture was only able to work one spiritual gift in the New Testament when they were given those abilities? It's because only the apostles were fully covered, fully immersed in the Holy Spirit. That's not to be said of anybody else. Now, Chris is about to talk about the instance of Cornelius, which is a really interesting account, so I'm going to let him go ahead and pick that up. Well, we find Cornelius over at Acts chapter 10. And in Acts chapter 10, of course, what's going on is there was a man named Cornelius, the beginning of the chapter says. He was a devout man. He was a prayerful man. He was a man who gave alms. He was a man who feared God. But he realized that something was missing, that he needed something more. And so he apparently was praying intently about what it was he was lacking. And an angel came to him and told him to send to Joppa for a man named Peter, and he will show you what you need to do. Well, Cornelius is a Gentile. Well, Peter goes, and of course we see in the text that he's very skeptical about being there. He tells him, it's unlawful for me to be here with you. A Jew shouldn't be here in the midst of you folks. So as Peter begins to speak to them, something interesting happens. And so this is Acts chapter 10, verses 44 and following. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, so he starts his sermon, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized, Peter answered, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. So you notice that even though they received the Holy Spirit, they still had to be baptized into Jesus Christ. And so that took place here in this text. Well, do we know that this is a Holy Spirit baptism? Well, there's a passage in Acts chapter 11, verses 15 and 16. This is where the Apostle Peter is telling the Jews about what happened. And so at verses 15 and 16, it says this, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did us in the beginning. And so it would seem from this statement of Peter that what happened to Cornelius' people is what happened there to the apostles. Of course, there may have been some differences in it also. But beyond these two examples, one of them being a sure thing and one of them being a possibility, we don't have any evidence of anyone being baptized in the Holy Spirit in our New Testament besides these individuals. Yeah, it's really kind of something to think about. See, with Cornelius' account, it's very limited. He makes the allusion to John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit there in Acts chapter 11. And so it's possible that that was a Holy Spirit baptism on Cornelius. But Peter had to go all the way back to the beginning when the apostles received the Spirit in that way to find another account of it. And also, we don't have anything else about Cornelius given to us to know if he was able to work any miraculous gifts other than speaking in tongues. But with the apostles, we can confirm that these individuals worked 
worked many spiritual gifts. They could do the full gamut of what the Holy Spirit was able to give. And so we can confirm that those men were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Also, it's promised to them in Acts 1, as we saw. And it's also promised to them in John chapter 16, where Jesus says to the apostles, I'll send the Comforter. He'll guide you into all truth and all of those things. They were going to receive the full measure of the Spirit there. And so when you just look at all of those things together, what we have is some facts. The fact is, is no one was promised to receive the Holy Spirit baptism besides the apostles. The fact is we can't find any account where we can prove that someone received the Holy Spirit baptism besides the apostles. And then we can also see that even with the apostles and others, it was limited in duration for how long the Holy Spirit would remain in this way. We don't have time to do a full study on it, but 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 9 and 10 allude to the fact that this was going to be limited in duration. You can read there in that text these words, we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. It's not just prophecy that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13 in that context. It's all of those gifts that were there, the miraculous type of faith that could do things like move mountains and all of that. Also the type of uh, spiritual gift that was tongue speaking and those things are all referenced there in that chapter. And so what he's saying is these things are here. We have them in part, but something more perfect is coming and those things will be done away. And in the context, we can see that seems to be an allusion to the completed inspired word that we have. We'd also want to note that becoming a Christian was separate from receiving yes. uh, the Holy Spirit. And we can point that out in a couple places. Acts 19, 5 through 6, the apostles there in Ephesus, and he says, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And so it wasn't just becoming a Christian that empowered them with the Holy Spirit. It was either the Holy Spirit deciding to do this, as happened in Acts chapter 10, to prove a point that the Gentiles now could receive the gospel to, or through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And so uh, they're just separate things, and we would contend that the Holy Spirit baptism is something that has ceased for us. There's one baptism for us to be immersed in water. Right. All right, well, our next question tonight just comes down then to really what we're talking about with this immersion in water, this way it was used, the one baptism in Ephesians 4, and what we see many other places in the Scripture. We just ask, what is the purpose of baptism? And that's, a, of course, an important question. So, Chris, what do the Scriptures say? Well, the Scripture says a lot of stuff. Baptism does a lot of things. And uh, it's sad because <clears throat> to many in the world today, the purpose of baptism has just been relegated to show people what's already happened inside of you. And the New Testament just does not speak about baptism that way. The New Testament says that baptism accomplishes stuff for us. And I use the word stuff because there's a lot of different things that it does. I mean, to point out some of them, I actually have a list here of ten different things that I can identify. The scripture says baptism does. It puts us into Christ. Galatians 3 and 27 says, For all of you are baptized into Christ, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. We learn as we look in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 that it puts us into the church. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. For by one Spirit you are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or Greeks. And we are all made to drink of one Spirit, we find. And so as we think about this, we understand that it puts us into the body. It's when we die with Christ, Romans 6 and 4 says. It's when we have a new life, Romans 6 and 4 says. It's when we are no longer a slave to sin, Romans chapter 6 and verse 6 says. It's when we're sanctified, Romans 6 and 22 says. It's when we receive eternal life, Romans 6 and 22 says. It's when we're circumcised, Colossians 2, 11 and 12 say. It's when we're forgiven, Acts 2 and 38 says. It's when we're saved. Think about these passages. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 explains this to us. That repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then 1 Peter 3 and 21. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what does baptism do? What's the purpose of it? It has a lot of purposes. That's right. You know, there's something else we can think about as well. There's a, a lot of text right there that Chris just gave us to think about. But here's something that's even kind of another layer that you see in the Scriptures with baptism. I want to suggest to you that baptism is the biblical way that in the New Testament individuals are to call on the name of the Lord. And so to prove that, I want you to go to Acts chapter 2 very quickly and read verse 21. Here you have a prophecy that's being quoted from the prophet Joel. As Peter begins this lesson, 
on the day of Pentecost, this first gospel sermon ever preached, he's explaining that what was going on around them with the Holy Spirit having come, they were speaking in tongues and that sound of a mighty rushing wind that was there. He says all of this that was going on, it was referenced by the prophet Joel many, many years ago. And it says in verse 21 from that quotation, it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There what you in this he says there's going to come a time when Gentiles and everybody even are going to be opened up this way that they'll be able to call on the name of the Lord for their salvation. But why do we reference it here? Because of what we just read a moment ago in Acts 2.38. When he gets to the end of that sermon and they ask, what shall we do? What does he tell them? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, some of them might say that's a little sketchy. That's Acts 2. He says they're going to call on the name of the Lord. Okay, then he tells them to be baptized. But look at this as well. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. Ananias says it this way. He says, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So how was it that Saul was to call on the name of the Lord? He was to do it by getting up and being baptized to wash away his sins. And so you see now in Acts 2 and in Acts 22 how an individual was to call on the name of the Lord was to obey the word of the Lord in the waters of baptism. It doesn't stop there either. If you were to go to Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, I want you to note this. It says starting in verse 12, he says, There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on Him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Then he says, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in Him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Now, if you step through that, you see several distinct things from one another in Romans 10. You have a preacher coming, a preacher speaking so that people hear. You have individuals believing what they heard. Then you have them separate and apart from their belief, calling on the name of the Lord. And what is the reference that he makes? Joel chapter 2, once again. Whoever will shall call on the name of the Lord. The same thing that was found there in Acts 2. In other words, you have three texts that separate out calling on the name of the Lord from belief. And in all three of those texts, you can rightly say, I would suggest in Romans 10 as well, that what you see there is a reference to the baptism that converts an individual to be into the body of Christ, as Galatians 3 and other passages say. Absolutely. So, baptism has many purposes for us today. And um, it's important, of course, to note some things that are not purposes of it. And so that kind of leads us into the next question. The next question being this. What are some misconceptions regarding baptism? And truly there's a number of different misconceptions we find in the world today. And what we're going to do is just kind of identify a few of them. So I'll let you give the first one, Justin. And you'll understand that we're not trying to pick on anybody with these or to offend anyone, but rather what we're doing is just recognizing some things that are commonly said about baptism that you can't find in the New Testament. And so, for instance, one of those things is that a special baptizer is needed. That is that you need a, a priest or maybe a preacher has to do it or a pastor or something like that in order to, for it to be effective. But look, the scripture doesn't say anything like that. Instead, what we see is that when an individual is obeying the word of the Lord, they're calling on the name of the Lord in the waters of baptism, that what it's about is the person that's obeying. And while there's a person there baptizing, it doesn't seem to point out any relevance to who that person is. In other words, they don't have to hold some special position in the church or something like that for baptism to be effective. And so when you have individuals that just look throughout the historical accounts of how this grew up in churches where they wanted special people to be baptizing, you understand that they, they can't have any scripture for that, that that's not something that's found in the New Testament. It's just something that religious groups started to say. Really, it was part of that clergy laity distinction that grew into churches, and it's not something that you can support with the scripture. Absolutely. You can even look at passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15 where the Apostle Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. I mean, this is an apostle. And oftentimes, apparently, he left the baptizing up to somebody else. And so it's not about the person 
uh, doing the baptizing. It's about that sinner being regenerated. And so we want to always uh, you know, understand that and make note of it. A second misconception about baptism is that many people believe the purpose of baptism is so that you can be added to a denomination or to become part of some lo- local entity of uh, believers. But as we look in our New Testament, we see that that was not the purpose of baptism. We don't find any evidence for that to be the case. Acts chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians 12, I just quote those because we just talked about them a moment ago. The scripture says, for we're baptized into one body. So we're baptized into one church, the scripture explains. We're not baptized into a denomination. In Acts chapter 2, there were 3,000 souls who were baptized. And the scripture says, the Lord added them to the church. Daily, those people who are being saved by being immersed in water. And so it's not about becoming a part of a denomination And it's not about becoming a part of a local church. People are not baptized into the South Side Church of Christ. They're baptized into the church of Jesus Christ. And then they have the responsibility to meet together with local saints such as this group here at South Side now that they have become a Christian. And so baptism is not to be added to a denomination as we learn. And really the idea of denominations is just foreign to our New Testament anyway. In 1 Corinthians 1 through 3, that was the problem. That's what Paul was condemning. This man over here says, I'm of Paul, and this guy says, I'm of Apollos. And that's why Paul said, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you because I don't want you saying, I'm a Paul-like Christian since Paul baptized me. And so he condemned denominations. And so that being the case, he certainly wasn't advocating people be baptized into some denomination. And another misconception that you often see in the religious world is that (coughs) infants need to be baptized. Well, this comes really, it's rooted in a Calvinistic type of idea that a child is born guilty of sin. See, the idea is that when my son was born, that he's guilty of my sin and also all the way back even to Adam and Eve and their sin. And so since he inherited that sin, then we should go ahead and baptize the child so that that child can be forgiven of their sins. But the premise is wrong to begin with, that you can't support from the Scripture that we inherit sin. In fact, you can see Ezekiel 18 and other places say the exact opposite, that a child will not bear the guilt of the father. But besides that, what we also think about is the idea that we've been seeing in all of these texts that baptism is what an individual does when they are responding to the message of the gospel. They hear and they believe and they choose to repent. And so this all comes down to the choice that an individual makes. And a child can't make a choice. A child doesn't understand anything going on. And so since that child can't make a choice, I'd suggest to you that also proves they can't sin because they don't know what they're doing. But besides that, they certainly can't choose to be saved. They can't choose to repent. And so since that's the case, we don't see infant baptism anywhere in our scripture. And the texts that are often used to suggest that it is there is when people say he and his whole household were baptized. But it doesn't say anything about the ages of anybody being an infant. If someone is baptized in the New Testament, anytime we're explained who they are, they're a person who is responding to the message of the gospel. They have to believe. Jesus himself said in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, when you go and preach, this is what you preach, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. A child can't believe, and so a child doesn't need to be baptized. And another misconception is the idea, kind of a sacramental view of baptism, which essentially comes down to people saying it's an outward sign of an inward grace. You know, it's to show people what has already happened to me on the inside. And the Bible just does not speak about baptism in that way. The New Testament does not present that as the purpose anywhere. And as we were looking at a few moments ago, I listed ten things the Scripture says that baptism does. And none of those are anything about showing people what's already happened. It's about it happening at the time of baptism. And so the sacramental idea is that it's just something that a Christian must go to, go through. But the Scripture is clear that it is what makes us a Christian. And so that's why it's done sometimes on infants in some religions is that type of view. And, um, you know, it's viewed as an action that's done to a person, you know, as some type of, of, of outward mark. But I would also, you know, think about Acts chapter 8. He talked about the eunuch a little bit. Apparently we're both going to be using the eunuch some tonight. But he's on this desert road. And, um, you know, like we said a moment ago, we're not baptized into a denomination. Here's the eunuch. He's converted on the side of this desert road. What denomination was he baptized into? There wasn't one. There wasn't a church there. And if it's an outward sign of an inward grace, who was he showing this outward sign to? It's just him and Philip. 
And so, um, you know, we, we see different texts like Acts chapter 8 that would seem to indicate to us that that's not what baptism was about, and those are just misconceptions that men hold today. That's right. Well, why don't we go ahead and move on then to our next question. We ask, by whose authority must we baptize? Now, Chris and I were actually talking about the grammatical makeup of the sentence, and we think that it's incorrect, but... It's the common way of speaking, so that's how we're doing it. So don't pick on us too much if you're an English teacher out there. Yeah, we know good and well it should say, must we be baptized? We must be baptized by whose authority? But that's just not the way we normally speak. <laughs> <laughs> we speak incorrectly. That's and right. So, uh, all right. Well, as we think about this question, what we're really doing is asking who it is that authorizes baptism, who is it that commands baptism to take place. And for that, we can simply turn to our Great Commission accounts that we have in the Scripture. For instance, go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, we're just going to read verses 18 through 20 very quickly. Jesus has been resurrected at this point. He has not yet ascended to the Father. He is teaching the apostles what they need to be doing as He is getting ready to send them out into the world. And this is what's said in Matthew 28, starting in verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now you'll note that the authority that's referenced there, he says, in the name of, that's by the authority of, is the idea there. It's like if I told you stop in the name of the law. I'm not telling you stop because Justin McCorkle says it. Stop because the law says you need to stop right now. And that's what Jesus is saying here in this passage. He says, you baptize by the authority of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. But note this as well. Jesus didn't give them a choice about this, did, did He? When He sent the apostles out, He commanded them to go and to preach this message. And so He's telling them, I give you this order. You baptize people to make disciples. So if the apostles were commanded to do this, then did the apostles command others to do it? You better believe that they did, right? And so if we are carrying on the message of the apostles, shouldn't we also be commanding it, just as Peter did in Acts 10, which Chris referenced earlier. He commanded that they be baptized in the name of the Lord. And so when we are talking about the gospel message, we're talking about authority. We're talking about what Christ wants us to do, and Christ has authorized, He's even commanded us to preach and baptize in His name. Certainly. And when we think about it, I mean, the simple answer is it's by Christ's authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not by the church's authority. And that's really, I guess, the distinction that we want to make here is that it's something that is commanded by Christ. It was given by Christ. And it's something that is regulated by Christ. When we look in our New Testament, we understand that it's something where someone is immersed in water all the way under, all the way up. We understand that it is something that is done on someone who's capable of belief. It's something where the sinner is becoming a Christian and their sins are washed away. They're freed from sin. And that's all regulated by Christ. He's decided it. We don't get to decide when or if we're going to baptize someone or why we're going to do it and so forth. It's not under the church's purview. The only thing the church is supposed to do is be busy carrying out the command in the way the Lord regulates. That's right. All right, well, moving on from there, then, we have to get down to the nitty-gritty of it all. If Christ indeed has authorized us to be preaching the gospel, we ask, are there prerequisites to baptism, Chris? Well, there certainly are prerequisites. Many gospel sermons, we have to hear the Word because the Word explains to us what we need to do. Romans 1, 16 and 17 says that the gospel is God's power for salvation, so thus Paul wasn't ashamed of it. And so we've got to hear that saving message. We've got to believe in it. Mark 16 says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And so belief is a prerequisite to baptism. So is penitence. You know, I can't just come and be baptized dipped in water thinking that everything's going to be okay. I'm making a commitment that when I come up out of that water, I'm going to live my life according to Jesus Christ. I'm telling the Lord, you know, I'm sorry for what I've done, and I'm going to do differently from here on out. And so I've got to be penitent. And uh, I've got to confess. Romans 10 and 10 says that with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I have to confess. And, um, you know, I, I've got to be old enough to do these things, old enough to understand these things. I've got to be mentally capable to do these things and to understand them. So there's really a number of prerequisites we find in our New Testament. Yeah, a really full account 
you know, if you think about it, the accounts are really interesting because you always have, you go through the book of Acts when you see the gospel being preached, you've got different accounts that emphasize different things that were done. But what we understand in the end is that all of those things were done in all of the accounts. They're just being emphasized in different areas. And Acts chapter 8 is a great example of that. If you want to turn there very quickly, we're going to read verses 36 and 37. Now what was going on here in this passage is as we referenced earlier, you have the Ethiopian eunuch who's traveling down the road. He's reading from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit tells Philip to go and walk along Inside the chariot, and when Philip hears him reading from the scripture, he asks him if he understands what he's reading. And the eunuch says, How can I unless someone teach me? And so Philip came up there and they begin to study from the book of Isaiah, and it says that beginning at this scripture, Philip preached Jesus to him. But then what we read after that, the following verse, verse 36, is as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, water. What prevents me from being baptized? He really is asking our same question just in another way. He says, what is the prerequisite for me to be baptized? I'm ready to do it right here. He had heard about baptism, of course, when Jesus was being preached. It's part of preaching Jesus. And so the answer is given to him in these words. He says, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. So there was a prerequisite given there. And there had to be belief on the part of the eunuch. And he answered... And said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So we see not only was belief there, he also confessed his belief in that. And so the confession was made not only for the benefit of the eunuch, but also for the benefit of the baptizer. And I know that Chris and I would also require someone to tell us that they believe these things before we baptize them, because baptism will be useless if they don't have belief. And so it had a dual benefit in that position for these individuals. And so it says they stopped the chariot, and they went down into the water. And whenever the eunuch came out of that water, and he went along his way, it says that he went along rejoicing. He had good reason to rejoice because of what he had done. He'd been forgiven. He had been put into the body of Christ, all of those things. And so his heart was merry because he acted upon the knowledge that he had, that he had been given from the Word of God. Certainly. And when Justin first mentioned this question and we started considering it together, we kind of approached it from different aspects. He was thinking about biblical prerequisites, and I was kind of thinking about man-made prerequisites. So there's also kind of a no side to this question, too. So we want to think about that for a moment. First of all, I mean, there's some denominations that teach you have to go through a whole bunch of classes about their denomination before you can uh, be baptized. And we just don't find anything like that in the New Testament. Listen, those folks in Acts chapter 2, what they knew was Christ and Him crucified, and they were the ones who crucified Him. And so once they heard that they had put Jesus on the cross, uh, who was the Messiah, and that now He was at the right hand of God, they were pierced to the heart, verse 37 says. And they said, what shall we do? And Peter didn't tell them, you need to go through, you know, 10 weeks of classes. He says, you repent and be baptized, each one of you, for the remission of sins. And so, um, you know, there's certainly no, you know, classes prerequisite to becoming a Christian. What we've got to do is know who Jesus is, know what He did, and know that I need to take advantage of it. Um, we also would note that uh, sometimes I've heard about a denomination that teaches you've got to go through this year-long repentance period before you can become a Christian. That's not what happened in Acts 2. Those people realized that they had killed the Messiah, and so they were baptized that very moment so that their sins could be taken away. Was there a lot of stuff for them to learn from then on out? Absolutely. Was there a lot of stuff that they were going to have to give up once they learned that they needed to give it up? Absolutely. But what was necessary at that moment was a commitment to do different, to stop sinning, and then to be baptized for the remission of sins. And so we want to understand then that sometimes men want to place other prerequisites on baptism. But what we need to do and what we choose to do here at the Southside Church is that we place no further burden upon anyone than what the Scripture places upon them. If you've heard the Word and you believe Jesus is the Son of God and you're willing to turn from your sin and confess His name before witnesses, then you need to be baptized and you need to do it now because that is how you become a Christian and you're free from sin. And that's exactly what was happening in Acts chapter 16. When the Apostle Paul had been in prison, Paul and Silas were there and they were singing and an earthquake came and the jailer thought that they were freed and was gonna, he was going to be executed by the Roman officials for letting prisoners escape. But when he realized they were still there, he came in and he asked Paul, Sir, is what we, must we do to be saved? And so Paul started preaching that he needed to believe the gospel. And so he preached the gospel to him. Acts 16.32, it says, They spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. There was no delay 
It was that hour of the night. When this man heard the word of God and he believed the word of God, it was time for him to be baptized. And so Paul, with stripes still on his back from being beaten, he got up and he went and he baptized that man. And that certainly is the way that we want to do as well, following the good biblical precedent. When a person is ready to obey the word of God, we're ready for them to obey the word of God. We'll stop whatever we're doing. I'll get up out of bed. I've done it many times, 2 o'clock in the morning, going down to the building to immerse somebody for the remission of their sins. And so keep in mind that it was important enough to the Apostle Paul to take care of it right then. It should be important enough to us as well to take care of it immediately. Well, our final question for tonight is this. Who should be baptized? And I guess uh, the, the uh, short answer is, is, is basically everyone needs to be baptized. And so I'll uh, turn that over to Justin so he can expound on that. Yeah, really, I was just thinking about Romans 6 as I was uh, thinking about this question. If you step through Romans 6, you see clearly what baptism was for. And so just to look to that chapter, just think about this. Basically, Paul says, if you want to die with Christ, then you need to be baptized. Verse 3 tells us that everyone who is baptized into Christ is baptized into his death. See, we're buried with Christ in the waters of baptism, verse 4 says. And so if you want to die with Christ, then you should be baptized. Also, anyone who wants to live with Christ should be baptized. Because in the end, that's what we're looking forward to, right? He says, if we have died with Him, we shall also live with Him there in Romans 6. And so what you see is, again, that it's not just about the death of Christ. It's also about the life of Christ, wanting to live with Him forever. Also, just everyone who wants to do God's will. Verse 17 of that chapter says that they obeyed from the heart that form of teaching. And what's he talking about in that chapter? He's talking about how they obeyed the Word of God in the waters of baptism. And so if you want to do the will of God, then you also want to be baptized. So like Chris said, in the end, everyone should be baptized. Everyone who wants to go to heaven, and that should be all of us. Everyone who wants spiritual fellowship with God, and again, I hope that's all of us. Everyone, everywhere, should respond to the gospel call that was originally given and is still going forward today. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. I would add also anyone who wants to avoid condemnation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6-8 through 8 tells us this, After all, it is only just for God to repay the affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We realize that there are also terrifying consequences for those who do not obey the Lord and submit themselves to baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we want to avoid those. And so it's about going to heaven, and it's also about avoiding condemnation. 1 Corinthians 6 and 11 puts it so plainly, for you are washed, for you are sanctified, for you are justified. And so that's what happens when we are baptized. And that's why we always keep water ready to us over here at the right, so that someone can be washed, justified, and sanctified whenever they are ready to do it. And so, on that note, we offer that invitation to you. The water's ready. Justin's about to go stand right there, and I'm going to stand right there, and Brother Keith's going to sing an invitation song for us. And so we're going to be here to welcome anybody that may want to take advantage of the waters of baptism this very evening.